Uh, welcome everybody to this session, uh, which is entitled Progress Towards Genomic Correction of CF Lung Disease. Um, my name is Patrick Harrison, and with my co-chair, Anna Cerazzetto, uh, we've assembled a panel of leading researchers uh, in this field for this session this morning. Just a couple of words from myself. The overall aim of this session is to review some of the latest strategies uh, which are available to permanently correct CFTR mutations in the context of delivering a, th a therapeutic strategy uh, for cystic fibrosis lung disease. Gene editing is already in the clinic for several diseases. The aim for us now is to try and look at the steps to get CF into the uh, uh, CF gene editing into the clinic as well. The four speakers today will deliver various different topics, um, but the educational objectives which we've set when we were uh, setting up this uh, session were to look at the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches for correcting different CFTR variants. We'd also like to raise in the discussion a bit later, is it a one-size-fits-all approach or a more customized approach to individual mutations? And we can't just edit, we also have to deliver, and we're going to compare and contrast some of the del delivery options, both uh, in vivo and ex vivo, which are available, and the different strategies. Each speaker will talk for about 22 minutes, uh, and then at the end of the session, we'll bring all four speakers back up onto the panel uh, podium here for a panel discussion. A uh, slight improvement from yesterday, we do have roving mics, but we'd also encourage you to be uh, placing questions on the app uh, during the session, and we'll come back to some of those. So, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker. Uh, we first met in Dublin about five years ago in a theatre at a gene editing conference. Uh, it's Professor Anna Cerazzetto from the University of Trento. Anna. Thank you. So thank you, Patrick, and I wish to thank all the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity today to present our work. Uh, in Trento, we are working uh, in uh, developing technology for genome editing and to apply it to uh, cystic fibrosis. So um, this is a, a scheme of uh, the concepts uh, and the differences between gene therapy and genome editing. With genome th therapy, the uh, initial concept was to complement the genetic defect by providing a wild-type copy of the gene or by using nucleic acids antisense to uh, modulate the transcripts. However, those are a technique that allows to uh, complement the defect but not fixing the gene. Genome editing goes back in time and uh, the principle here is to repair the endogenous genes in order to uh, have the gene fixed within the chromatin uh, locus, so allowing to preserve all the regulatory elements that are needed to have a physiological activity of the gene. Uh, genome editing, uh, it's, it goes back in the 90s, uh, however, 70s, sorry. However, it took time to generate a technology that allows to have a precise and e efficient technique for, um, modifi to modify the gene. With uh, CRISPR-Cas, of course, the field uh, took off and uh, with uh, allowing to uh, generate technology that uh, efficiently modify the uh, chromatin, the genome, and uh, allows for, um, uh, to program uh, uh, efficiently the modification. So the uh, genome editing basic is that we need to introduce a DNA double strand break in order to modify the genome. Uh, the um, uh, DNA double strand break would stimulate the cell to repair the, uh, the, the cleavage, and uh, this repair would uh, uh, in turn determine modification. Uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, allows to do this uh, procedure in a very efficient manner because Cas is the nuclease and the RNA module is uh, the part that allows to, uh, to uh, program the modification in a specific spot. So after uh, we design the uh, uh, RNA module, we can, introduce mod uh, we can introduce cleavages in specific spots, which ends into uh, a repair through non-homologous enjoining, which de determines uh, the uh, uh, known program or the output is, output is not completely um, possible to, 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 to program. However, if we use um, uh, micromology and joining, we can design a modification that can be uh, uh, predicted upstream. 
The most precise modification that we can obtain is through uh, homology directly repair. In this case, uh, the uh, DNA double strand breaks is accompanied with uh, a donor DNA, which carries a specific uh, homology with a target site, and this leads to a precise repair. Of course, inducing a DNA double breaks is something that raises some skepticism because uh, by de indu determining cleavages, these may come together with uh, uh, genomic rearrangement. So in time, the technology has evolved with, uh, more, uh, um, uh, with, with techniques that are more uh, safe. And these are, for example, base and prime editors that use Cas9 as, instead as the nuclease as a knee case. Uh, Cas9 in this situation uh, induces single strand breaks and uh, uh, it comes together with uh, modifying enzymes that determine modifications through the amination or reverse transcription. So in this situation we can modify the genome in the absence of DNA double strand breaks. Uh, I like this uh, uh, slide from David Liu, who is a pioneer in the field, who is presenting here uh, uh, all the possible technology that we can apply based on CRISPR, depending on the type of modification that we need to introduce. So uh, either if we need to introduce a point mutation or a small insertion or uh, also a large insertion, we can choose the best technology that is more appropriate for our uh, purpose. And so this tells you that how far uh, the, the field has gone in producing the proper technology that can be designed uh, for the type of application. Uh, we, uh, um, as a lab, are working hardly on the technology, and we decided that uh, one of the best uh, uh, fields to apply the technologies is uh, cystic fibrosis. So we started back in time by uh, targeting uh, splicing defects, uh, um, and uh, uh, the work sta was started by Julia Maules in the lab. Uh, we, we started with, uh, spice, with this splicing mutation, the 3272 mutation, which is located into the intron 19. This mutation is, uh, uh, de determines a transition from, a a to, from a, an adenine to a guanine, which uh, determines the formation of a novel uh, um, expert, uh, acceptor splice site. This uh, mutation does uh, uh, leads to the formation of uh, a, a transcript which carries an extra sequence. And the presence of this extra sequence determines the formation of a stop codon in the subsequent exon, and thus the lack of uh, CFTR production. To set up these, uh, the genome editing procedure, we um, turn very often to mini-gene models that are very um, efficient in terms of uh, setting up, experimental setup of the uh, technique. So Julia pre uh, prepared two type of mini-genes, a wild type and uh, um, a wild type and mutated mini-gene. And as you can see here, the uh, mini genes recapitulate the splicing defects. Uh, this is the wild type transcript, while the mutated transcript has a higher molecular weight because it's carrying an extra sequence. So after setting up these uh, mini genes models, she then uh, tested a number of uh, Cas9 orthologs. Uh, she also looked for the best guide RNA, and then she, after she selected the, both, the, the best, she tested in, uh, in the cell line. She was able to reach uh, uh, almost more than 60% editing, and uh, the transcript was nicely reverted to the wild type with uh, quite high efficiency. And then, of course, we uh, needed to uh, uh, prove that this uh, uh, strategy was valid in more, uh, uh, in more relevant uh, experimental models. For this, since we were new in the cystic fibrosis field, we asked a collaboration. We were lucky enough to find a very um, valuable collaborator. So uh, together with um, Marianne Carlon's lab, we were able to test the technology in, uh, uh, in organoids. And thanks to the uh, Primary Cell Culture Service, which is uh, organ a service organized by the Italian Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, we were able to test uh, the uh, technology also in epithelial cells. So with epithelial cells, we were testing the editing efficacy, the splicing analysis, 
and the organoids allowed us to, in top, on top of analy uh, analyzing the editing, also to measure the function of CFTR in terms of, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, volume of organoids. But Marianne will tell you more about this, uh, um, uh, this kind of models for genome editing. We tested the uh, uh, editing profile, so this is the outcome by using Cas12a as a, a nuclease, so this is the uh, targeted uh, mutation. And Cas12, uh, uh, by using this uh, type of guide RNA, determines uh, variable lengths of uh, uh, deletions. Those deletions are found also in the organoids, and uh, those are the uh, mutations, the, sorry, the, the uh, deletions that allow to um, inactivate the mutation that generate the splicing uh, uh, activity, the alternate splicing. These are the editing efficacy that we obtain in the epithelial cells, so uh, almost 40% uh, editing. Uh, also, high efficiency editing was obtained in organoids. And uh, these are the um, uh, functional tests in the organoids. Uh, the organoids are very useful experimental models. Uh, uh, those derived from the patient have uh, limited uh, volume. And after the editing, we were able to uh, reach uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, volume that we could uh, observe uh, as um, similar to the control where CFTR is delivered. Uh, by quantifying the uh, volume, we have been able to reach a uh, 2.5-fold increase in uh, uh, organic volume. We apply the same strategy also for uh, another mutation, uh, splicing mutation, the 3849 uh, uh, mutation. Also in this case, the uh, mutation is intronic. So we were uh, confident about using a cast nuclease as uh, a tool to repair this mutation. And we found that uh, even uh, in this case, the application in organoids were uh, able to reactivate uh, CFTR, leading to an increase of, uh, um, uh, of the, the volume of the organoids. Every time we apply the genome editing technology, besides looking at efficiency, of course, it's very relevant to look at the specificity of the technique. So we have looked uh, both genome-wide, so we look at all the off-target activity, and also at the um, um, potential editing of the second allele. Uh, so for a genome-wide technology to measure the off-target use of technique, which is called uh, GuideSeq, this technique uh, is based on uh, the incorporation of uh, double-strand oligonucleotides every time Cas or any nuclease induce a, uh, a cleavage. So after this uh, um, incorporation uh, through deep sequencing, we can measure how many of targets uh, are uh, uh, identified throughout the genome. Uh, it, for both mutations, we found that uh, after, of course, selecting the best nuclease and uh, the more appropriate uh, uh, guide uh, RNA, we found that there were no off-target uh, detected. Uh, in terms of allelic discrimination, we did the deep sequencing analysis to test both the target allele, uh, so identifying uh, almost 80% of the editing, and we also analyzed the editing on the second wild type uh, allele. Uh, the, uh, in, in those cases, the amount of editing was uh, reduced to background level. Similarly, for the other mutation, we had uh, a quite good editing in deep seek, deep seek analysis and a very reduced uh, uh, um, editing on the second uh, allele. So as I mentioned before, however, the, uh, in the, the, the cleavages that are induced raise many skepticism, and uh, uh, there are a number of reports now showing that uh, cleavages uh, induces uh, not just off-target activity, but also on-target activity, meaning that uh, uh, every time we modify uh, the target site by cleavage, we can induce major re um, genomic rearrangement. Uh, we can induce deletions, uh, translocation, uh, up to formation of extra nuclei due to uh, genomic rearrangement. 
Therefore, other technology are probably needed uh, to control the possibility of all these uh, uh, negative outcome. And uh, this comes with uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, prime editor and base editor that induces just a single strand, a single strand ink. So this is the outline of uh, the uh, new technology, uh, base editor and prime editors, we will hear more uh, during the session today, uh, use uh, cast uh, nickase that uh, is associated with uh, uh, a functional domain, uh, in this, for base editor is uh, the aminase, for prime editor is a reverse transcriptase that also induce a, a formation of uh, the DNA template. Uh, Simona Mistari uh, started to work on another splicing defect, the 2789 uh, uh, mutation. This mutation is uh, located again in uh, the intronic region. However, the position is very close, very adjacent to uh, the, uh, the exon. This means that by using a nuclease activity, such as the strategy that I shown before, this may induce a modification in the exon that, of course, would determine a major impact in the expression of CFTR. Therefore, in addition to that, this kind of mutation is a G2A transition, so uh, it's a, the, be, the, the best application for this kind of mutation was uh, uh, suggested by uh, the base editor. Uh, so Simone started to use this base editor, and uh, again we turned to the mini-gene models that are very useful to set up the... Um, to set up the genome editing procedure. This is the targeted uh, adenine, and uh, we tested a number of base editors showing that they all had quite good editing activity. However, as you can notice already from these results, in addition to editing the main target, we also had edits on adjacent adenine. We nevertheless moved on, look at uh, the efficacy of uh, this uh, strategy, and uh, by looking at, again, the mm, splicing profile, if this is uh, the uh, wild type uh, uh, transcripts, and this is the mutated uh, uh, transcript produced by the mutated gene, uh, by using the base editor, we uh, could uh, re-establish um, a good amount of uh, uh, wild type transcript. Nonetheless, we were uh, quite uh, concerned about these uh, uh, side effects, uh, side activity. This is quite normal for uh, base editors. They are known to have uh, a window of activity. Uh, so um, on top of your target adenine, other adenine uh, can be uh, targeted as we observed from our results. And those could be either within the window of action of the, uh, the aminase, but also beyond that. So we, were, we started really to look carefully how much this uh, uh, bystander um, um, modification may affect our strategy. And we initially use uh, a, um, in silico analysis. Uh, so it's possible to use in silico analysis to check uh, which is the efficiency of the splicing uh, following uh, the um, uh, digit in the sequence that we are using. We observed that the adenine uh, to G uh, transition in position four may affect the splicing efficacy compared to the wild type. We then, of course, uh, also uh, validate uh, experimentally uh, the impact of this uh, bystander activity. Simone so produced a number of uh, mini genes containing all the modification. And uh, while uh, some bystander effects were not uh, uh, impairing the strategy, specifically the G4 uh, modification was uh, counteracting uh, the positive results that we were obtaining by modification of the specific adenine. So we then started to consider what we could do in this condition. I mean, base editor have these uh, side effects uh, and there's not much to do uh, so far to reduce that unless you work with the uh, delivery. It's known that uh, genome editing is uh, both the efficacy and the specificity highly depends on uh, delivery uh, technique. In particular, the time of expression and the level of expression of an editor highly affects the outcome of the uh, genome editing. 
So we decided to turn to the delivery of RNA. In the previous experiment, we were using lentiviral vector transduction. RNA is, of course, very transient and is now widely used in, in the field. So we had applied to a number of models, and of course, with Marianne, we tested in organoids. And we found that uh, while we were still obtaining a good editing activity, we could uh, uh, control the uh, side uh, modification of the adenine. So the adenine 14, which was the most uh, um, critical adenine, was reduced, and also, uh, while the other were not really impacting the uh, splicing uh, repair, so we were not really concerned about those. Uh, this, uh, by RNA delivery into organoids, we were able to reconstitute the activity as it's uh, um, demonstrated by a volume uh, reconstitution. And then we also tested in collaboration with uh, Luis Galleta at TGEM the um, short circuit current uh, in uh, um, air liquid interface epithelia. And uh, also in this case, we were able to see a recovery of the proper current in presence of the base editor that was uh, uh, um, uh, delivered through um, RNA uh, electroporation. And these are the numbers showing the reconstitution of uh, uh, the epithelia. So I, I hope I gave you a flavor of uh, different situations that we may encounter, different type of mutation, and the requirement of uh, um, a thorough uh, evaluation of the type of technology. There are a number of technology, and among those also uh, the prime editor. Uh, we have uh, started some work. Uh, Alessandro Umbach has a poster uh, today, so please uh, go to visit him to see uh, our results on this field. And uh, I wish to finish with a few um, considerations. So where are we? Uh, definitely we have uh, a great excitement and enthusiasm in uh, using the technology for uh, genome editing to uh, repair uh, genetic defects. Uh, however, even if uh, everything seems easy, every mutation really needs a very careful evaluation in terms of specificity and in, in terms of uh, side effects. So what's next? Uh, definitely we cannot be overridden by the enthusiasm and uh, much work is still needed to be done. We still have to work intensively on the specificity both for the off-target but as well as, uh, as for the uh, on-target uh, side effects. Uh, we need to work on the efficiency. There are certain areas of the genome that are, it's very hard to modify. Uh, we also have uh, some uh, negative results that uh, we, of course, we have no time to share on the five, uh, 508 deal um, uh, mutation. This mutation is very, for some reason, is very hard to modify, and there are certain uh, chromatin structure that uh, um, uh, it's it's difficult to overcome. Uh, we have to consider the immunogenicity, especially if we want to consider an in vivo delivery of uh, the uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, systems or any genome systems that will come in the future. And of course, the, the biggest uh, problem is the delivery. Uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, is a large cargo, which uh, is uh, hardly compatible with uh, the um, uh, transfer vectors that uh, currently are in use. So even these really require a lot of effort uh, in terms of uh, uh, development. But let me thank my laboratory, who is intensively working uh, in the technology and uh, the application in uh, genome editing. Uh, and of course, the very valuable uh, collaborator who are uh, giving us uh, all the uh, uh, needed uh, culture regarding uh, cystic fibrosis. So in first, uh, Marianne Carlon, Annabella Ramaglio, uh, at TGEM, uh, Luis Galletta is uh, helping us uh, very intensively. We have uh, great help from uh, the Fondazione Ricerca uh, Italiana, who are also giving us uh, um, great uh, reagent resources and all the other uh, collaborations. And uh, thank you all for your attention.
Okay, thanks, Anna, for that really fabulous uh, overview. Uh, now, I just need to get the screen back up. Give us a second, just to... <laughs> Not for the first time. Oh, here we go. Okay, so it's my great pleasure now to uh, introduce, introduce our next speaker, Matt Porteous. Um, people sometimes ask me, when did I first get interested in gene editing? And that's an easy question for me. Um, it was 11 o'clock on Thursday, the 2nd of June, 2005, when I read the first Think Finger paper, uh, of which Matt was a co-author. So Matt was the stimulation for me to get interested in this field, uh, and it's a pleasure to introduce him now today. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. That's the first time I've heard that introduction. <laughs> but actually, that's, those are, that's a real introduction. Uh, let's start. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you uh, all for being here. Thank you um, for uh, including me in this session. So I'm going to uh, talk about advancing a cell-based genome editing strategy for cystic fibrosis, primarily focused on uh, uh, developing a strategy for serious sinus disease. Um, and just put in the subtitle there that, you know, this is genome editing, and particularly when you think about uh, genome editing with autologous cells, is precision, personalized medicine. Uh, many of the key words that you hear from uh, a lot of our uh, colleagues. Um, I have, well, let's see how I do this. There you go. Um, so I have, um, luckily, genome editing is exploding. Um, I have some potential conflicts of interest, but for CME purposes, none of these are real conflicts of interest because none of them sell a commercialized drug, and I then uh, caveat that with yet. Um, the next slide is actually my favorite slide in the whole uh, deck because it shows um, my former postdoc, Sharon Vaidyanathan, outside his new uh, faculty office door at Nationwide Children's Hospital, in addition to showing um, all of our uh, team members at Stanford, including Don Bravo, a postdoc in Jay Karnayak's lab, Jeffrey Wine, a longtime long mentor and um, uh, sage uh, for us, Jay Karnayak, our uh, ENT collaborator, Tushar Desai, an adult pulmonologist, Zach Sellers, a pediatric gastroenterologist, a GI doctor and expert in CF, and finally Carlos Mila, who many of you know. So one of the things that we're opti optimistic about is the development of uh, cellular drugs uh, to treat um, not only uh, genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease, but other diseases. And one of the reasons that I think cellular drugs have um, tremendous potential is they have entirely different pharmacokinetics and hopefully a beneficial pharmacodynamics. That is, they move around the body in a very different way, and they could affect the tissues in a very different way. And this is an example of where we have labeled hematopoietic stem cells, or semiprogenitor cells, with a luciferase a GFP construct, which uh, you'll see again later, into a human CD34 hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, and transplanted them into the left femur. And what you can see is that the day, um, at the day of transplant, uh, that the cells are sort of distributed. In fact, all those blue dots are probably background. But quickly, they localize the site of the transplant. But also, very quickly, within weeks and certainly months, these cells have not stayed localized at the site of the injection, but have migrated, grown, and expanded to all the tissues. Because this is the biologic property of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And as we uh, move forward in my... Uh, uh, presentation, and we talk about performing the same sort of uh, therapy using the stem cells of the respiratory epithelia, namely the basal cells, is can we take advantage of the biologic properties of basal cells? Now, they may not have this same property of being able to migrate, but that's an interesting question for us to, to learn about. 
So um, we are a lab that focuses on nuclease-based homologous recombination, which Anna just nicely described. One of the reasons that we're excited about this platform is that it allows us to uh, make a large number of different changes, including single nucleotide changes, insertion of wild-type copies of the gene back into themselves. And those are really the two um, strategies that I'm going to emphasize uh, or, or discuss as it relates to cystic fibrosis. Um, and again, I, I will uh, uh, move through this quite quickly because it was explained quite well, but the concept is to design a Cas9 nuclease that, or to design a guide RNA that went complex to the Cas9 molecular scissors. It is brought to the site of interest, in this case, it's the target site of interest. The power is, is by simply re, uh, uh, designing the last, or the 5 prime 20 nucleotides of the guide RNA, we can reprogram where this uh, very powerful and efficient nuclease uh, makes its breaks. Once the break is made, the break can be repaired in a number of different ways. But as I mentioned, we are primarily interested in homologous recombinational repair. So we provide a donor template that serves as a template for the uh, natural recombination machinery. And through a copy and paste mechanism, the sequence on the donor template will be introduced at the site of the break. And so. Uh, uh, here we've turned a target site of interest to a target site of great interest. But as mentioned by Anna, the competing pathway of creating indels um, is there and present. Now, in many diseases in which you're trying to correct a broken gene, creating another broken gene is probably not so much of a problem. But when we think about cystic fibrosis and delta F508, delta F in fact, creating indels is a problem because now we've turned perhaps a drug responsive allele into a non drug responsive allele. And that is something we're going to have to think about. The system we use is uh, to modify cells outside the body using, um, by purifying the cells of interest, um, putting them into cycle because the recombination machinery is uh, most active or probably only active in SNG2 of the cell cycle. We deliver our CRISPR-Cas9 as a, a, a ribonucleal protein complex where purified Cas9 is complex to a synthetic guide RNA with N modifications to give it stability. And I've listed some of those sources. We use a variant of Cas9 uh, discovered at IDT with a single, nucle a single amino acid change uh, that gives it about a 30-fold increased specificity without losing on-target activity. And we deliver this complex um, via electroporation. We then deliver the donor template not as a naked DNA molecule because we have learned that in cell types like uh, bronchial epithelial cells and hematopoietic stem cells is there's an abundance of cytoplasmic sensors to naked DNA, uh, uh, most notably TLR9 and the sting pathway that will activate the type 1 interferon response and make our cells sick. So we, we've commandeered AAV6 as a serotype that has evolved mechanisms to deliver its, uh, its uh, single-stranded DNA content to the nucleus without activating these cytoplasmic sensors to a significant extent. And I show on the right that this uh, system works very well in a large number of human cell types, uh, most notably for this audience, uh, in basal cells. Whoops. Oh, man. Let's see. There you go. So for the first, I'm just going to quickly uh, diverge into a blood disease, um, and the disease is uh, oh my God. sickle cell anemia, um, which is a, a devastating, uh, destructive um, genetic disease of the blood in which every patient has the same single nucleotide mutation in the beta globin gene. Uh, it's a global disease, and I'll discuss, of course, cystic fibrosis is incre increasingly recognized as a global disease. Um, with uh, resulting early uh, mortality in Africa and early mortality and significant morbidity in the United States. Um, and so we, um, a large team of people, um, including Annalisa, Rasmus, Danny, Job, and many others, designed a donor DNA template, sorry for the uh, little formatting uh, problems, the old Mac to PC issue, um, designed a donor template that would correct the underlying uh, mutation that causes sickle cell disease, as well as introduce mutations to prevent recutting uh, of the, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 guide to create indels, and synonymous mutations to um, enhance uh, homologous recombination between the cut site and the change we wanted to make. And using this system, we could achieve between 60 and 80 percent uh, alleles corrected uh, in, in the laboratory. I'll note, since this is a diploid gene and we only need to correct 
uh, one copy of the gene, it actually, 60% allele correction, it, it translates into about 80% of the cells having at least one allele corrected. That is creating a heterozygous um, state. Recently, uh, Kyle Cromer um, um, looked at a, using, a, in a collaboration with Illumina, uh, did ultra deep sequencing of a panel of cancer associated genes, and we could find no evidence that in the genome editing process, acquired mutations in p53, rb, p10, or any of the number, any of these other 500 genes was acquired. In distinction to a couple papers uh, that came out in Nature Genetics a few years ago, that implied that CRISPR editing would create and select for mutations in p53. Those experiments were a bit flawed because they didn't show that the CRISPR editing process created p53 mutations. They doped in p53 already mutated p53 cells into a population that was treated with CRISPR-Cas9 and showed that they would expand. Well, anyone who studies p53 said, well, that's of course what would happen. That's the whole nature of the mutation. But this is important because it shows our editing process, ex vivo, is not generating detectable mutations in some of the most important safety genes in the genome. So um, we uh, cleared an IND a couple years ago. We licensed the sickle cell program to a company, uh, Graphite Bio, with, with whom I'm a founder of, and so since have a conflict. And the first patient was dosed with their own cells, having gone direct gene correction of the underlying mutation as part of an autologous uh, bone marrow transplant. Now a little over two months ago, um, and the company hopes to report on the results of the first uh, few patients in the middle of uh, next year. The point being is this is, gene correction is now in the clinic. Not simply gene editing, making knockouts, but gene correction is in the clinic. So now moving to cystic fibrosis in the last, ooh, I gotta talk fast, 12 minutes. Um, I'm not gonna go over the mutational spectrum. I crossed out the 70 to 100K, sure, and we gotta get rid of that number, because it's wrong based on your own data. Uh, there's many more patients in the world than 100,000 based on some analysis that Jerome and Zach Sellers have done and their colleagues. So first, just uh, reviewing that we can apply the, the sort of, of course, we're not changing a single nucleotide in the Delta F508 situation. We're, we're adding back in three nucleotides to rescue uh, the phenylalanine. This uh, work was published by Shriram and colleagues in Cell Stem Cell a few years ago. But what, uh, and so I'm not gonna review the data, but the concept is we're going to remove uh, sinus basal cells from a patient. We're going to expand them, ex purify the basal cells, expand them, uh, correct the underlying mutation, embed the cells into a matrix, and then transplant those cells back into the sinus as a potential treatment for serious sinus disease. We can discuss, I know the sinus isn't the lung, we can also discuss that the sinus remains a serious cause of morbidity in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, in this paper, we propose embedding the cells in a porcine SIS membrane. I'll show you some data that we've migrated away from that to a different um, uh, way to embed the cells. Technological um, improvements continue, and recently in the lab, we have shown that if we can inhibit the non-homologous end joining process uses a small molecule inhibitor, we can increase the frequency of gene correction of the delta F508 mutation in upper airway basal cells from about 50% to 75%, with a concomitant decrease in those indels, which I mentioned for delta F508 is something we would want to decrease. So now, instead of an HDR to NHTG ratio of 2 to 1, we're getting ratios of 13, approximately 10 to 1. So the predominant of the added alleles now are gene-corrected alleles, not indel alleles, which is, I think, powerful as we think about potentially applying this uh, to Delta F508. Now, just to remind, it was discussed yesterday a bit that the estimation of the number of patients who have non-modulator responsive uh, uh, genotypes um, was only 6%. Um, but again, Zach and Shuram in their COVID project went, uh, did some epidemiologic uh, research using the Canadian and UK registries and um, identified that in patients from uh, South Asia, the number of alleles that would not be amenable to uh, modulators was close to 40%. And then combining this uh, with uh, Sorry, uh, work from McGarry and uh, Macaulay um, and, and extrapolating, 
what they, what they calculate is is that when you when you calculate the the prevalence of cystic fibrosis in Asia, Africa, and South America, that the total number of patients with the disease may be closer to 300,000 rather than 100,000. And when you take into account the global distribution of genotypes, the number of patients who which they would not be eligible for modulator is closer to 40% rather than 6%. So very, uh, I think maybe we need to start thinking about diff differently if as the mantra is, and I 100% agree with it, is that no, no patient should be left behind. So with that in mind, how can we correct these uh, variety of mutations that um, are, are scattered throughout the genome, not just the Delta F508 mutation? And so for that, we built on two, two studies that we had done in the lab. One uh, led by Mar Mara Pavel Danu, in which she demonstrated in um, hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, she could take a wild-type copy of a cDNA and knock it into the start codon and rescue the downstream mutations in hematopoietic stem, stem progenitor cells, and this was done for a disease called SCID-X1. Now the problem is, is that, uh, as you all know, is that for CFTR, the genome, the cDNA, is too long to fit into a simple uh, AAV uh, donor construct, which has a capacity li limit of 4.7 kb. So Rasmus Back had actually shown you can expand or you can increase the uh, cargo size, not by making the cargo of any single AAV better, but by de developing a method in which we do a serial sort of double targeted integration with half going in at the first and then the second half going into the second and thereby expanding the size of the transgene we can introduce to closer to 8 kb. And now this gives us the flexibility of, of, of introducing the full CFTR cDNA at its start codon. And so this is what uh, Shuram did, um, and it was published in Molecular Therapy a couple years ago. And the overall target integration frequency does go down, um, so we're down around 3%. But by introducing an inert cell surface receptor, we use a truncated version of CD19, uh, we, we can then use either ma magnetic bead or flow cytometric enrichment, increase the percentage of cells that have the, the, the targeted integration of the full uh, CFTR cDNA up to over, you know, close to 60, 60 to 80 percent. And when these upper airway basal cells are differentiated into an, in an air liquid interface culture and the, very, and the usual uh, physiology is done, what you can see is, is that um, <clears throat> on the, on the right-hand side is, is that the uncorrected CF patients have very low uh, conductances. The non-CF patients give us our spread of controls uh, of, quote, normal in this assay. And in red, you can see that the gene-corrected um, uh, airway basal cells differentiated in ALI reach conductances that are equivalent uh, to wild type. So all well and good, but you're going mad. Still, cells, we don't know how to transplant those into any uh, epithelial layer. So how are you going to do that? So the first thing we needed to do was go back and revisit which material we wanted to embed the cells in to transplant them. And so uh, Shreem looked at a number of different biomaterials listed here and identified biosilk and fibrinogen as biomaterials for which the upper airway basal cells uh, proliferated and maintained their uh, basal cell phenotype as marked by KRT5 or cytokeratin 5. Um, <clears throat> and so that's good. So then the question is, well, will they engraft? And this is... Um, now, this is now the really the key next step and something that's never been done before. And this was, uh, again, led by Shuram and Don Bravo on Jay Karnayak's lab. And unfortunately, we have a little Mac to PC issue here. But when uh, Don took uh, luciferase labeled and GFP labeled uh, mouse upper airway basal cells and transplanted them in a in, in, a, in essentially an autologous manner back into the mouse sinus, you saw a complete or, or sustained uh, engraftment of these upper airway basal cells in a mouse-to-mouse -mouse experiment. And when she did histology, she could see that these GFP-marked basal cells were integrating throughout the epithelial layer of the sinus. Really quite remarkable. So we did this because if this didn't work, there was no way putting human cells into a mouse was going to work because of all the xenogenetic barriers that would, be, uh, would also contribute to the lack of engraftment. But once that worked, we then provided Don with uh, gene-corrected cells, um, in this case, well, gene-targeted cells, in this case marked by luciferase, um, <clears throat> and she transplanted them into immunodeficient mice sinuses 
in which the sinuses had been debrided using a chemical method, which is not what we would do in patients, but the mouse sinus is way too small to debride it, unlike what Jayakar do, can do in a human, which is just debride the sinus um, uh, mechanically, and showed while there was variability uh, in terms of engraftment, there was persistent engraftment, uh, as demonstrated by light emission coming from the sinuses, for um, one and a half, and actually this, this has been taken out to 100 days. So again, very promising uh, that there is um, stable uh, long-term engraftment. Um, uh, sorry. So then, um, Don uh, Sharon provided Don with cells that were edited in the way I described. The full cDNA is so cystic fibrosis derived basal cells from the sinus edited to knock in the full cDNA within CD19 as a self surface marker. And so now that gives us a number of different ways to stain for what cell types in the epithelium of the sinus are present. And what you can see is in, in these uh, images at day 75 post-transplant, so two and a half months, um, there are patches of human cells that are marked by our gene-corrected cells, shown in green in CD19 right here, embedded uh, around uh, uh, mouse cells. So uh, really uh, pretty remarkable. And then um, when she stained for the different types of epithelial cells, we see basal cells shown in white. We shall see um, ciliated cells shown in red with alpha tubulin and goblet cells uh, shown in green. Now the proportion of these, each of these cells it may not be exactly what's in a human, but again, I think we should uh, refrain from overinterpreting what we would expect to see in this kind of very odd uh, xenogenetic model of putting human cells into a mouse uh, sinus epithelium. But nonetheless, the cells are present and detectable. In the interest of time, I don't have time to show that um, actually at a, at a broader histologic view, we can see that the engraftment of the human cells is throughout the sinus that they were put into in a patchy way. So um, we'll have to, you know, look at whether, but, but in a pretty significant way. Um, it wasn't just, I'm not showing you the only patch uh, in this sinus. So what's our next steps? So our next step is for me uh, to review our pre-IND meeting materials and get them submitted by November 11th so that the FDA can give us feedback on our proposed trial in December of 2022. Um, then uh, they, we will have formal guidance from the FDA in terms of the studies we need to do in order to um, uh, have successfully get an IND cleared. Um, so we'll need to do the process development, we'll need to do the safety and tox studies, and we'll have to formalize our clinical trial design. But as I said, it's outlined for uh, patients with serious sinus disease who are either have genotypes um, that are unresponsive to modulators, Po, uh, patients who are post uh, lung transplantation or patients who are intolerant of their or unresponsive to their modulator therapy. So in sum, you know, what once could only be drawn on a chalkboard can now be done with very high specificity and efficiency. I've shown you one method of genome editing to do that. Technological improvements will continue. Uh, we can insert a full cDNA at the endogenous start codon and physiology is rescued. Shuram and Ann Harris and Giando Turciano are doing even more studies looking at the specificity of the process and the chromatin uh, rearrangements of the process, which are surprisingly, uh, uh, surprisingly positive, and hopefully uh, they'll be able to talk about this at future meetings. We can engraft these cells, which is, I think, we believe the first time ever a uh, cellular transplant has been done for uh, an epithelial layer. And as I said, we need to execute on the IND enabling experiments, and then we need to think about if this works in sinuses, how are we going to get down uh, to the lower airways where even more significant disease is. Thank you. I very much want to th uh, thank the CFRI who have been a really close partner to us and have enabled, uh, have funded really key, key steps for us when uh, we needed them. And then I'll just end by showing um, some pictures of, of my lab. I uh, had to write a letter of recommendation the other day and realized we have trainees from every continent on the world except for the Antarctic. But, you know, that's fair. So I'm really proud of that uh, for this global disease to have a global lab. And I look forward to your questions during the panel session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that, Matt. Um, so we've seen two editing strategies in a lot of detail. It's now my pleasure to introduce 
uh, Marion Carlon. I first became aware of her work about four years ago uh, with her work on uh, splice, editing splice mutations. And uh, she's going to talk today about something different, something we've not heard about yet, which I believe is uh, prime editing. So that should. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I'm very um, happy and excited to be here in the session on progress on genomic therapies for CF lung disease. Um, and I'd really like to thank the, the chairs for inviting me to this session. So within the next 20 minutes, I will cover our work on prime editing to rewrite specific drug refractory CFDR mutations. Just see, this moves. Sorry. This is... Uh... Oh, really? Oh, my God. It has to go right there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for technical support. Okay, so I have no disclosures. I'm just quickly going to put up my pointer. Yes. Okay, so um, the work I'll be presenting is really uh, situated within the main goal of um, this session, um, and it's really targeting the basic defect towards a cure. It also is situated within the current therapeutic landscape, uh, at which there are now really highly effective modulated therapies for the majority of patients with CF. Ooh, this is still okay. Oh, sorry, this is a mess. Okay, but so, so um, what is it currently still the situation is that there are current patients left behind which carry mutations which are not eligible to these modulated therapies. And so if we look at these last 10 to 15 percent, um, many of them care, carry rare mutations, and many of these rare mutations are not well characterized. But what is also um, quite surprising is that some of these mutations, which are not approved to current modulator therapies, are relatively frequent after a 5 way DEL. And so the two mutations I will be covering in my presentation, on the one hand is N1303K, which I will uh, touch upon briefly towards the end of my presentation. But most of my uh, focus for now will be on the, the missense mutation L227R. So this mutation is um, a rare mutation. So there are 19 patients described in CFTR2, of which five in Belgium. This mutation gives rise to a severe and pancreas insufficient phenotype. And unfortunately for this patient population, the mutation is really drug refractory, as you can see from the organoid data. So you see that the triple combination is not able to rescue any function. When we then look into um, another assay, um, which allows to look at a molecular defect, and in particular the plasma membrane density, we see that this mutation has no residual plasma membrane CFDR, and also that the two correctors from the triple combination are not able to increase any of its um, plasma membrane CFDR. The other mutation I will briefly touch upon uh, at the end of my presentation is N1303K, which is the fourth most common mutation. Likewise, it gives rise to a severe and pancreas insufficient phenotype. This mutation uh, is not completely drug refractory, but rather it gives a moderate response to uh, CFTR modulators, as um, many groups have shown, including uh, work from our own. So you see here that at most there is um, a response similar to the luma iva response in a 5 way del homozygous samples. So why do we choose prime editing for these two missense mutations? Well, if you look at the specific point mutations they give rise to, these mutations actually cannot be corrected by the classical or the, the best studied base editors, which were touched upon in the first presentation. And so actually prime editing is a novel uh, gene editing technology that really allows to correct any given point mutation. And so besides being able to correct any given point mutation, it also allows to correct in, uh, in null mutations and, and frame shift mutations. So the theoretical applicability of prime editing is about 93% when you look at all CF causing mutations. But of course, we also need to gather experimental evidence for this. 
So um, in case you, you're not familiar with prime medicine, I will briefly introduce how it works. So what we see um, in, in the center is the Cas9 nuclease in blue. It is catalytically impaired at one side, so actually it is turning into a Cas9 nickase. It will nick the strand um, at the top. Again, is that my pointer, yes. Um, and so, so it doesn't create a double strand break. And then so um, fused to this Cas9 nickase is, is a reverse transcriptase, which is shown in gray. And so actually what the reverse transcriptase does is it can retrotranscribe an RNA sequence into a DNA sequence. So if we then look at the prime editing guide, we have classically tool guide RNAs, a spacer which is complementary to your genomic region of interest, flanked by a PEM site. But what makes it really unique is that it has a three prime extension, which on the one hand has a primer binding site, and this primer binding site will bind proximal to the NIC site. And on the other hand, you've got a reverse transcriptase template in which you can insert your correction of interest. If we then, so sort of in a simplified manner, what the prime editor does is it writes a new strand with the desired correction into the DNA at a given genomic site. Now, after a process called flap equilibration, it's, uh, uh, it's the cell's own DNA damage repair that deals with this heteroduplex, which is installed. And in the best case, you end up with a wild type situation, but it's also possible that you revert back to the CF condition, which we don't want. So actually already, already in the 2019 paper from Anzalone, um, a very important element was um, de uh, described, which is really important to push this DNA damage repair to introducing the correction on both strands, and that's the nicking guide RNA. And what is actually also important for this nicking guide RNA is that if you have the possibility to really design a nicking guide to be complementary to the correction, this really enhances editing outcomes. So, um, so with, what we first did was really um, look into the prime editing guide RNA designs because they're not really straightforward rules to just pick out the best design. And therefore, we also chose to perform this first screening in HEC293 T cells overexpressing the respective CFDR mutants. And so the different prime editing components are introduced into the cells by transfection. So we have the prime editor, the prime editing guide, and the nicking guide. And so to read out this precise um, uh, point mutation correction, we, uh, for most of the time, use Sanger sequencing. And what you then get is a, a very precise a nucleotide substitution, which you can quantify. This is a bulk readout by editor analysis. And so, uh, so the first thing we did was indeed look into the prime editing guide RNA design. So first, uh, we designed different prime editing guides with different uh, spaces. And so you see here at the bottom, that they cover different uh, distances between the NIC site and the edit that you want to correct. So these are also color-coded um, in the different colors. Besides that, we looked into different primer binding site lengths and reverse transcriptase template lengths. The most important element, actually, that really increased editing outcomes is the adding of the nicking guide. So these are the, um, the dark bars, let's say. Um, so actually, to sum up, what we see here is there is quite some flexibility in prime editing guide RNA design, and multiple of these guides actually allow precise um, correction of the mutation. But importantly, this nicking guide RNA, uh, this PE3B system, really enhances editing outcomes. Now, it's nice that we can get this precise correction on the DNA level, but how does it correlate to a correction on the protein level? And so for this, we subjected the same prime editing guides to an assay on the protein level, and so we assessed the number of cells that were corrected to wild-type appearance by looking at the plasma membrane localization. And you can already see just looking at the pattern that it is in very similar. But indeed, the correlation graph shows that uh, the DNA data really nicely correlate with the protein data. So we really get precise on-target editing. Now, what I showed you, this, this um, plasma membrane localized CFDR, we can also just read out by confocal microscopy. And so what we use is we have cells uh, expressing CFTR cDNA with a triple HA tag in an extracellular loop. So this allows to really assess uh, CFTR present in the plasma membrane. And so wild type cells look like this. And then when we look at the mutation, as I already introduced at the beginning, it's a mutation that really has a severe processing defect. So there is really no CFTR in the plasma membrane. After adding the prime editing cargo, we really can correct this wild-type appearance in a population of cells. 
Now, besides being able to correct um, plasma membrane uh, localized CFDR by prime editing, we also wanted to see that this recovers CFDR function. And so for this, we used a halide sensitive YFP quenching assay. And as you can see also here, we can recover CFDR function in between the non-corrected and the wild type CFDR control. So this, is a, this looks very nice. Now, since the first um, announcement of the Prime Editor in 2019, there have been multiple um, improvements to the system to really further enhance prime editing outcomes. And one of these um, enhancements is adding a capped, um, or let's say a, a structured RNA motif to your prime editing guide RNA at the three prime extension. Uh, and so this is described by Nelson and colleagues. And so the reason this is added is that it protects the three prime extension from getting degraded by cellular uh, nucleases, which would hamper your prime editing outcomes. So we first validated it on a, on a well-studied um, prime editing site, RNF2, and indeed this capped structure enhances editing outcomes. For our mutation of interest, there was an increase, although it was not significant. Nevertheless, we chose to continue working with this capped version because we reasoned, and it's also been shown in literature, that in primary cell model, this might be of more importance. Now, when we talk about um, prime editing or gene editing in general, and we're permanently modifying the genome, we also need to be sure that what we modify in the genome is safe. And so for this, we performed a targeted deep sequencing. So first, we validated our Sanger sequencing uh, readouts on target. And so we really uh, look in prime editor cells, which were treated with the peg RNA in the nicking guide, that we get a precise on target correction of about 33% in this case. You can also see that we introduced a silent PAM disruption edit, which doesn't alter the amino acid sequence. So next, we looked at the safety or the off-target profile. And so for this, we really looked throughout the human genome for both the prime editing guide and the nicking guide, which regions within the human genome would be um, potentially subjected to off-target editing based on complementarity with some mismatches for both the prime editing guide and the nicking guide RNA. And so for this, we um, approached this uh, off-target analysis in two ways. On the one hand, we started with an experimental off-target approach by GuideSeq. And so here, we combined uh, the prime editing guide and the nicking guide RNA with a cutting Cas9. So the cutting Cas9 introduces double strand breaks. Um, it was nice to see for the prime editing guide that we had hardly any of targets, uh, and it was also really low. For the nicking guide RNA, there were a bit more um, of target edits um, seen, some of them a bit more frequent, but we do need to again note here that this is a cutting Cas9, whereas the prime editor in the end just has a Cas9 nickase. We also um, looked into in silico predicted of targets, and from both of these procedures, we took the top ranked of targets, some of them are actually similar, and I subjected them to targeted deep sequencing. In this case, we treated the cells with the prime editor in combination with the prime editing guide and the nicking guide RNA. And then we really looked at the nick site, both uh, introduced by the prime editing guide and by the nicking guide, to see if there was any evidence of indels created by potential double strand break. And I think we're actually very um, reassured to see that overall the off targets were really very low, generally below 0.1%. Uh, of course, this is all work done in hex cells, and hex cells are still far away from actual patient-derived cells. And so what we really wanted to do next was move towards a primary patient-derived cell model being the organoid model or the rectal organoid model. Now, I think you're probably all familiar with this model. It really has earned its place in precision medicine testing and in vivo um, treatment uh, response prediction, in particular in a small molecule field. And so we really read out CFTR function by organoid swelling. What is also nice about this organoid model that despite being of gastrointestinal origin is that the organoid swelling responses nicely correspond to um, uh, clinical endpoints beyond the gastrointestinal tract. So for example, FEV1. And lastly, this is an assay that can be performed at medium to high throughput. Now, usually how organoid swelling is quantified is that we uh, quantify the overall organoid surface area increase, which is, for example, shown here. This makes a lot of sense for small molecules, where we reason that a small molecule can enter every cell in every single organoid. But for gene therapy or gene editing, 
we um, believe it might be more, um, more important to actually quantify individual organoids that are corrected to wild-type CFDR. Also, uh, it's important to sort of briefly explain, explain how we perform these organoid experiments. So we delivered a prime editing cargo to single cells, and then the stem cells amongst these will grow out into a new organoid that then allows to assess swelling. So in order to be able to identify these individual um, corrected organoids, um, through collaboration with Chefi Gasadaval, and in particular Bing Nam Liu, we set up an AI-based algorithm which allows to determine the number of swelling organoids via um, AI relative to the total organoid count. And so with this kind of readout, we started assessing prime editing in um, patient-derived organoids, homozygous, for, the, for this mutation. We first started out by looking at the prime editing guide versus the capped version, and indeed this capped version does increase editing outcomes to about 20% of the total organoid population. This is nice, but there is definitely room for improvement. We also looked into this PUM disruption edit. So the PUM disruption edit uh, is in general um, a safety precaution that is applied frequently in CRISPR strategies because it avoids re-editing. But besides that, it also has a specific advantage in theory as it would potentially enhance prime editing outcomes by evading mismatch repair. Now, overall, in our case, we didn't see substantial increase, but I have to note here that in literature, literature it's been described that more mismatches actually favor this enhanced outcome. So this is something we haven't looked into yet. Now, I think the, really the most substantial improvement to our prime editing outcomes in organoids was adding the nicking guide RNA. And again, so this is the nicking guide that binds uh, to the corrected strand. And so here we really obtained 70% and actually recently even up to almost 90, 100% of corrected organoids. So I think this is really um, a very uh, promising result. Now, um, we also looked into the genomic correction, and like in the hex cells, we get a very precise nucleotide substitution in the bulk population. And so when we plot the number of um, corrected organoids relative or in relationship to the genomic correction. Overall, it's a nice correlation. In general, we see that we have a lower amount of genetic correction, which still gives rise to a functional recovery, which is, I think, promising. Of course, this also has to do with the fact that you only need to correct one allele to uh, regain the wild-type um, phenotypic appearance. Lastly, we also looked into prime editing not only the homozygous organoid samples, but also a sample which is compound heterozygous for this mutation. And also here we get similar, equally um, high um, editing efficiencies. And then I would like to end uh, with briefly touching upon the other mutation from my introduction, N1303K. Uh, and so also for this mutation, we started by looking into um, determining the best prime editing guide. Uh, in the hex cell model, um, similar to what I described for the other mutation. And so with the best um, prime editing guide, we uh, set out to also see on the protein level if this is able to correct the processing mutation defect. Uh, so this n 13 k is a processing and a gating defect. And because this mutation is not completely drug refractory, but actually shows moderate responses, functional responses, in um, organoid and, and airway models, we thought it would be interesting uh, just to put the, the rescue by the triple combination next to the, the rescue by prime editing. And so I think it's, it's really nice to see that the prime editing strategy really allows to recover this mature um, uh, CFDR. And of course, it, it is comparing apples and pears in the sense that small molecules are really quite a different kind of therapy than, than gene editing. But nevertheless, uh, it is um, a promising element to further continue with. And then maybe this is just a general question that we always wonder how much CFDR should we correct to, to provide a clinically meaningful benefit. So this is a recent figure from um, Sermé Girardon and Vermeule. And I think what sort of comes out of this uh, scheme is that we don't need 100%, and maybe and not even 50%, but anything in the range of 5 to 10 to 30% of in vivo functional recovery would already lead to a clinically meaningful benefit. And so to end my presentation, um, so I've shown that we, we can sort of rapidly screen for different prime editing guides in cell lines uh, for, for, um, for a specific CFDR mutations, which we then validate in, in the primary organoid model. We've shown efficient prime editing for the L227R mutation, 
with minimal of targets. The organoid model, we believe, is a good model to assess gene editing evaluation because it contains the native CFTR. It provides patient genotypes and in particular also all the rare genotypes. And lastly, it correlates nicely with clinical endpoints, including FEV1. Now, future work will be very much focused uh, on delivery, where it needs to be efficient and safe, where it needs to consider the target cells, which are CFTR expressing cells, and the CFTR expressing cell has been revisited with all the single cell RNA-seq data that came out recently. And lastly, um, although ideally we, we would really like to correct or even prevent lung disease, if we can already um, reduce the severity of lung disease, I think that would already be uh, very meaningful to patients. And so um, I'm now coming to the last part and the most important part, acknowledging all the people involved in the work. Uh, in, on, on the one hand, the people from my team, and in particular, I need to mention Matthias Bulkan, who is really a driving force uh, on this work I presented today. And besides that, I really want to acknowledge the different people at KU Leuven from MOLMET, the Viral Vector Core, the Biomimetics Group for the AI Algorithm, the long-standing and nice collaboration with the Organoid Lab, and lastly, also the group uh, from Anna Zetto for the CRISPR and of target expertise, and of course, also the, the funding agencies for making this possible. And so with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions in the panel discussion. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Marianne, uh, for that. So we've had three talks looking at how we edit by lots of different strategies uh, in lots of different ways with great efficiency. And we've even heard about delivery of uh, cells, modified cells, back to a person. Um, but for the editing strategies, if we want to use these in vivo, then we need to define, define ways to deliver this uh, in vivo. So it's a, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Stephanie Cheng, who's now going to talk about uh, some polymeric nanoparticles for non-viral uh, delivery. Oh, sorry. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that uh, for the introduction. Um, so I am from uh, Johns Hopkins University, and I'm working with uh, Jordan Green um, over in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And, and as mentioned, um, I'm going to be pretty light on genetic details uh, today. I'm going to be focusing. Uh, rather than on kind of the genetic constructs we're trying to deliver, but rather more on the delivery vehicle that we've been developing for non-viral gene therapy. Uh, so very briefly, here are my disclosures. Um, so many people in this room may be uh, familiar with some of these, um, these concepts already, so I'll be uh, a little bit brief, but um, the idea here is that uh, in order for DNA or RNA or other, you know, any nucleic acids to enter cells, um, they generally have to be encapsulated into some sort of delivery vector um, or nanoparticle um, in order for these large hydrophilic, um, very charged molecules to be able to cross the cell membrane. So once these types of particles um, are uh, internalized by the cell, um, they then need to escape from an endosomal compartment uh, to reach the part of the cell where they can be active. So for DNA plasmids, generally they have to be transported into the nucleus to be expressed. RNAs will often have to end up somewhere in the cytoplasm, although some may need to end up in other compartments as well. Um, and so we and others um, in the field have spent a lot of time trying to deliver, uh, trying to develop materials that will be able to accomplish um, all of these. And in our lab, we focus generally on uh, the use of polymeric nanoparticles um, to help uh, nucleic acids cross the cell membrane. And one of the reasons that we really favor polymers uh, for, for gene therapy um, is, uh, and, and some of these are issues that were brought up in, in uh, previous talks, um, there are uh, safety advantages to using uh, these types of materials. So uh, viruses are, uh, you know, kind of the traditional uh, gene delivery vector. Um, they're very efficient. Um, they have evolved over millions of years to be very good at, uh, at delivering genes to cells, but they are associated with um, certain uh, potential safety uh, concerns. 
Some of these include the immunogenicity of viruses. I'm kind of lumping uh, viruses in general into one broad category. There are nuances in the different types of viruses that are used, but in general, viruses are intrinsically immunogenic. This can lead to toxicity um, when administered to patients. Certainly, it's something that is seen preclinically. Um, and even if we don't see overt toxicity due to an immune response, um, it does generally mean that a virus uh, is unlikely to be able to be administered more than once. So these tend to be kind of one and done types of therapies. Um, so if we use synthetic polymers that are not intrinsically immunogenic in the same way that viruses are, or even some non-viral uh, materials like lipids can be, uh, we have greater flexibility over the ways that we can administer these types of, uh, these types of therapies. Nanoparticles, uh, polymeric nanoparticles also have very large cargo capacity. Um, and again, this is a, a topic that was, um, that was mentioned in some of the previous talks as well. So um, as far as we're aware, we, we don't really have a limit to the size of the gene that we can deliver with these types of particles. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about how uh, these particles form. Um, but we can deliver not only very large genes, but we can deliver multiple copies of the same genes. We can deliver multiple genes or even different types of nucleic acids all within the same nanoparticle. Um, again, this gives, this gives us uh, a lot of versatility over the uh, ways that these types of particles can be used. Um, and finally, uh, because we synthesize these materials ourselves, we have a lot of chemical control over their material properties. So we can try to design them to be very safe. We can design them to be um, able to target different cells or have tropisms for different types of uh, tissues after injection. Um, and there are already kind of manufacturing processes um, that are known and have been developed for, uh, for the production of these types of products, these types of um, synthetic nanoparticles, which kind of makes uh, this technology very amenable to um, eventual translation into a product. So in our lab specifically, we focus on a class of polymers called polybeta amino esters, or PBAs. Um, so just very briefly, um, at the bottom here, this is the synthetic scheme that we use to make these polymers in our lab. And um, in short, uh, we take one uh, molecule from this category I'm calling the base monomers, the B monomers, one from the S monomers category, and then one from the NCAP uh, category. So we uh, mix and match these three uh, types of monomers, um, and that forms our polymer. So you can see that just by using these different uh, molecules that I'm showing here, and really there's an infinite um, number of different types of small molecules that we could potentially use, uh, we can generate this huge library of different materials um, using combinatorial chemistry. And all of them will have slightly different chemical properties, but they can all form nanoparticles with nucleic acids. Um, and so I do want to point out some of the properties that all of these materials share. So all of our PBAs um, are hydrolytically degradable. They have these ester linkages throughout the backbone that makes them uh, degrade very quickly um, in uh, physiological conditions. So most of our polymers will fully degrade within a few hours or in some cases a couple of days, uh, which allows them to avoid any potential toxicity that could be caused by the material itself. It also allows them to release um, their cargo very quickly once they enter cells. Uh, they have these uh, amine groups throughout the backbone of the polymer, in some cases um, at the ends of the polymers as well. Um, these uh, confer, uh, confer a positive charge on the polymer that then allows them to complex electrostatically with negatively charged uh, uh, nucleic acids like DNA or RNA. Um, and because the formation of these nanoparticles is really a self-assembly that's driven by electrostatic interactions, um, the polymer is really agnostic to the sequence of uh, the, the, the gene that's being delivered. And what I mean by that is that from the polymer's point of view, every DNA plasmid more or less looks the same. Every uh, strand of mRNA pretty much looks the same. Um, and this allows us to very easily swap different genes in and out of these particles, um, and then again use them for different types of applications in a kind of plug-and-play manner. Um, and finally, a lot of the polymers that I'll mention um, in today's talk also have this uh, lipophilic side chain. So this is a long hydrocarbon tail uh, that we incorporate into some of our polymers. It's just a way for us to be able to dial in different amounts of hydrophobicity. And it's kind of just one of those um, chemical properties um, that we found to have uh, quite a lot of effect on um, how well these polymers work. Um, and uh, it gives us more flexibility um, over the way uh, 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 that these um, materials will interact with nucleic acids and how they will eventually interact with cells. Um, so in general, in our lab, in order to find the types of po uh, polymers that are good at transfecting cells, we use this high-throughput screening approach. Um, so this is just showing a very small example where we took um, a cell line uh, that was uh, cultured in vitro um, and tried to deliver DNA plasmid encoding, GFP, um, as a reporter gene, green fluorescent protein. 
Um, and by doing this, we can um, identify different polymer structures and different formulations of polymer with DNA that are particularly good at transfecting this cell type. And over the years, we've been able to use uh, this type of method as well to transfect other types of cells. Um, I promise there is transfection in uh, this image shown here. Uh, it's a little bit of a formatting issue. But we have been able to show transfection um, of reporter genes in uh, cancer cells, in stem cells, iPSCs, fibroblasts, um, as well as uh, cultures of liver cells and, and cells from the brain. Um, and so this is something that we've done uh, many times over the years. Um, and it's all very well and good to be able to deliver these types of reporter genes, these GFP and uh, RFP uh, type of fluorescent proteins. But ultimately what we want to do is to deliver functional genes. Um, and so when we started working on gene editing applications, uh, we started with DNA plasmids that were encoding Cas9 um, and a guide RNA. So we had two separate plasmids that were then co-encapsulated into the same nanoparticle using PBAE uh, uh, polymers. Um, and then in order to test editing efficiency, we had a reporter cell line uh, that contained a red nano lantern expression cassette that was preceded by a stop sequence. Um, and successful editing uh, on either side of that stop sequence would result in excision and then uh, would allow that red nano lantern gene to turn on. So essentially, whenever we had successful editing at those two sites, we would see uh, red fluorescence from the cells. So we had a student uh, who then implanted these reporter cells into a mouse and then injected these uh, PBAE nanoparticles directly into that same site and was able to show uh, successful editing, um, just indicating that, you know, as a proof of concept that this, uh, that this idea could work. From there, we've uh, now started working with Gary Cutting over um, at Johns Hopkins as well um, on, on cystic fibrosis as an application. Um, and so here, we then took CF8 cells, so these are uh, bronchial epithelial cells, um, and used a similar type of screening approach to uh, find what polymers would be good at transfecting these, uh, uh, these cells with, um, in this case, mRNA. So here we were using mRNA encoding GFP as a reporter gene. And as you can see on the left here, we do have very good uh, transfection efficacy with some of our polymers. Um, this polymer that I'm, for simplicity, just calling here polymer R, um, was able to transfect about 80 to 90 percent of these cells um, in vitro. Uh, we were also able to repeat this in primary nasal and bronchial epithelial cells as well, uh, with the same polymer, um, polymer R, standing out as one of our uh, top candidates. So once again, after we do our uh, initial screening with our reporter genes, we then want to move into a functional application. So here we went back to our CF8 cells, which have um, a known uh, mutation in CFTR uh, that causes loss of function. Um, and so the cutting lab uh, uses an adenine-based editor uh, to correct this mutation. Um, and so we wanted to see if we could uh, transfect these cells with uh, that base editor um, and their guide RNA um, and then lead to uh, a gain of function in CFTR. So uh, here we had uh, CF8 cells that were transfected with, uh, with PBA nanoparticles um, containing mRNA encoding the adenine base editor, DNA plasmid encoding the base editor, or mRNA encoding GFP as a control. Um, and using short circuit, we could show that we do in fact have uh, restoration of CR uh, CFTR function in the cells, uh, particularly the ones that were uh, treated with the mRNA encoding the base editor. So that's shown in green here. Not only that, but it could also be, this could also be combined with other treatments that are currently used in the clinic. So here, um, the cells after being treated with the nanoparticles uh, were also treated with Ivacaftor. Um, and what we found is that uh, we were able to see about 8 to 10 percent wild type restoration. And as we heard from the previous talk, that's in the range where we're starting to see some clinically uh, relevant uh, uh, phenotypes. So, um, so that's something that we're very excited about. Of course, this is the, uh, just an in vitro situation, and we are hoping to repeat this soon in primary cells as well. So just to kind of wrap up this uh, first part of this talk, um, we have these polybeta amino esters that um, can form nanoparticles with different types of nucleic acids, and then we can screen the different materials that we make um, to find the best ones at delivering genes to particular cell types. Um, and then we can use this to deliver uh, uh, Cas9 and guide RNA or in other types of um, editors um, that are encoded in DNA or mRNA uh, in order to cause uh, gene editing in vitro and in some cases in vivo as well. So from there, we then wanted to move into the in vivo case. So in vivo, the problem is now that we need to reach the right cells and we need to uh, cause gene editing in, in uh, the particular cell types and the particular organs that are causing disease. 
So these are all mice that were injected with PBA nanoparticles containing mRNA encoding luciferase. So you can see uh, very easily um, that some of them, uh, depending on the chemical structure, which are different across these different panels, um, some of the particles end up in the lungs and transfect uh, cells very well there. Some of them end up in the liver or the spleen or in other parts of the body. So for uh, cystic fibrosis, we're largely targeting the lung epithelium. Um, of course, this is a, a multi-system disease, so uh, we are kind of keeping an eye on other organs as well. But for kind of early studies, we're starting with um, the epithelial cells of the, of the lung as our primary target. Um, so from here, we started playing around a little bit more with some of the um, other chemical properties of these materials just to kind of hone in a little bit more on uh, how to optimize these materials. So shown um, on these images here um, are mice that were treated with PBA nanoparticles. All of these PBAs are chemically the same except for one uh, terminal group at the end. So just a small difference in the end caps of these polymers um, actually causes a huge difference in how well they work um, after in vivo injection. Um, so, for example, we have this one that we call E63 um, that has the highest overall transfection, but uh, it turns out that it's, it's not just the overall transfection we want to look at. We really want to focus on transfection in the lungs, which I've highlighted here. Um, and so while E63 might be the best at overall transfection, it's actually not the best in the lungs. We have other polymers that we find work better there, such as E39 um, or E58. Um, so that very small chemical change not only affects the overall transfection efficacy, but also affects the tropism um, of these particles after injection. Um, and just to mention also one of the other chemical levers that we can play with to try to, um, to tailor the properties of these nanoparticles, uh, here we dialed in different amounts of that lipophilic chain that I mentioned um, and on an earlier slide to uh, change the hydrophobicity of these polymers. And by doing so, once again, we were able to um, adjust the overall levels of transfection um, in the mice as well as the transfection levels in the lungs, which are shown here. Uh, we're also interested in other uh, routes of administration. So these particles can be administered a number of different ways. Here are, are mice that were administered uh, particles intranasally, so then they inhaled the particles um, into the lungs. And you can see we do have some transfection in the lungs as well as uh, uh, um, in the nasal tissues. So this is a very kind of easy and um, non-invasive method to easily access the lungs. Um, the caveat here being that we don't really expect uh, these particles to get to a lot of tissues outside of the lungs or in the nasal passages. But initially, while we're trying to target the lung epithelium, um, this seemed like a, a, a good one to, um, a good route to look at as well. Now, all of these recent slides that I've been showing you um, were using mRNA particles with luciferase, which shows us generally where the particles end up. It shows us that we are getting um, some transfection in the lungs and other organs. But if we want to look at transfection on a cell-by-cell -cell level, we turn to this AI9 reporter mouse model. So in these mice, um, all of the cells contain this TD tomato expression cassette that's preceded by a flux uh, stop sequence. Uh, so if we can introduce Cree recombinase into these cells, uh, we uh, have recombination at the LOXP sites that cuts out the stop sequence and turns on the TD tomato gene. So in these mice, we deliver PBA nanoparticles containing mRNA encoding Cree recombinase. And if we have successful transfection, um, it should result in the cell turning stably red. So there's a, a stable edit that results in red fluorescent protein turning on. Um, so then we can look at uh, organs um, uh, using whole organ imaging like IVIS, or we can also use uh, methods like flow cytometry and IHC to kind of look at these cells at a, on a single cell level. Um, and so that's what we did um, in this experiment here. So here we had mice that were uh, injected with nanoparticles intravenously a single time or multiple times, or administered particles intranasally uh, once or multiple times. And again, just starting uh, with the lung epithelium, um, I'm showing here on the top how we gated these cells, just so you know how we defined each of these populations that I'll, um, I'll be mentioning. In our control mice, these are mice that were untreated. We don't see any TD tomato expression, so that tells us we have very little background uh, signal in this reporter mouse model, which is great. But we, when we deliver uh, nanoparticles um, IV a single time, we have about 7% transfection of epithelial cells in the lungs. Um, and interestingly, if we uh, administer these particles more than once, not only uh, uh, is the multiple administration quite well tolerated by the animals, but it does seem to boost the, the efficacy of the transfection as well. Uh, intranasal administration in this case was not quite as effective as we had expected or hoped that it would be. I'm going to come back to this um, in a few slides, but for the most part, uh, we've been focusing on the IV administration method as a way of um, being able to target epithelial cells of the lung. 
So within those epithelial cells, uh, we can identify particular populations that seem like they are uh, particularly well transfected. So here we can see that after a few IV injections, we're able to transfect 25 to 35, 25 to 30 percent of the bronchial epithelial cells um, uh, in the lungs. Uh, there are some other cell types that I want to mention that are being transfected as well. So, for example, endothelial cells are very um, efficiently transfected using this method, um, with almost 60% of those cells uh, being transfected after IV injection. Um, now, this isn't necessarily the cell type that we're uh, primarily interested in for CFTR correction, but for other diseases that affect the lung, including asthma, where you know endothelial cells may play more of a role, that is something that we're looking into, um, and something we just kind of want to keep an eye on so we understand which cells are being affected by this type of treatment. A population of cells that we are more interested in is the stromal cells of the lungs. Um, and it's been shown in literature that some of these may be the progenitors that are leading to CFTR expressing um, epithelial cells down the line. And so if we can uh, correct CFTR in these uh, cells, that could be uh, very interesting and, and could um, be very effective. Uh, and so in uh, uh, using IV injection, we can uh, transfect up to about 30% um, of these cells. Now, I'm defining these fairly uh, vaguely as just the cells that do not express the three major kind of lineage markers that we stain for. Um, in future studies, we are going to uh, look at that a little bit more closely to see if we can um, identify exactly which populations of cells um, these actually are. Um, and finally, I also want to mention leukocytes. So these are CD45 positive cells in the lungs. These are the immune cells that are resident um, in the lungs. And uh, one thing I just want to mention is that our intranasal administration actually seems like it's mostly hitting these cells. Um, and follow-up studies have shown that by intranasal administration, we're mostly transfecting alveolar macrophages in the lungs. Again, this is not a cell population that we were initially really aiming for, um, for CFTR uh, correction, although there, are, there, there is some work showing that um, you know, macrophage function may be, um, uh, may be affected by loss of CFTR. Um, but this could also be useful for other types of applications, including vaccine uh, uh, types of, uh, of, uh, of projects and um, studies looking at uh, infectious diseases um, of the respiratory tract. So that's something we're looking at uh, mostly for that. But for uh, correction uh, of CFTR um, and, and trying to hit epithelial cells of the lungs, we're uh, focusing on intravenous uh, administration. And one of the advantages there is that we are also able to reach organs outside of the lungs. So here, as an example, um, in the liver, we do have some transfection after a single injection of nanoparticles. Um, we have about 4% um, of, uh, of non-endothelial uh, and non-immune cells uh, in the liver that are transfected. Um, and again, in future studies, we're going to look a little bit more closely at this to see if we can understand which uh, populations are being transfected, as uh, liver disease is, um, is, of course, important in CF as well. So overall, uh, what, I, what we've seen here is that uh, PBA nanoparticles um, can be designed to transfect cells in the lungs after IV injection. Uh, we have a lot of transfection of endothelial cells, but we're really encouraged to see uh, that we also have a large population of bronchial epithelial cells and stromal cells that are being transfected um, as well. Um, and we, uh, we found that multiple administrations are very well tolerated, and it seems like they, they do boost transfection efficacy. And so down the line, we imagine this as a kind of therapy that could be administered multiple times to increase the total population of epithelial cells that are being transfected, or potentially to, um, to continue treating uh, a, a patient um, if the, the effect of the therapy um, decreases over time. Um, and in the future, as I've mentioned, uh, there are some uh, certain populations of cells that we want to dial in on a little bit more closely to really see exactly what's being transfected. We're also interested in looking more closely at other organs um, that might be affected. Um, we also want to start uh, tracking the proportion of transfected cells over time um, so we can see if the transfection affects the turnover rates of these cells or get a sense of how often we might have to um, administer this uh, type of treatment for it to be effective. And we'd eventually like to move into a, a CF mouse model or a rodent model so we can see if we can cause in vivo gene editing um, to actually have um, an effect on the disease phenotype. Um, so this is a, a delivery platform, a technology platform that we've been developing for many years um, in, uh, in, in Jordan Green's lab um, over at Johns Hopkins. The cystic fibrosis is a relatively new area for us to be stepping into, but uh, what, what I really like about this platform is that it is very versatile and it can be applied in a lot of different ways. So um, I'm really glad to, to be here at this, at this conference with all of you and, and hope to have a really great discussion about uh, you know, ways in which this could be used uh, to treat CF. 
And I want to uh, mention uh, especially Aaron Kavanaugh, um, who is a PhD student um, who is co-advised by Jordan Green and Gary Cutting um, at Johns Hopkins, who's done really amazing work and is uh, the person who uh, collected all, a lot of the data um, that was shown here, um, and as well as the other members of the Green Lab who have worked with me and our funding sources. So thank you very much. And uh, again, I'm looking forward to any questions, comments, or suggestions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. If I can just invite uh, the other panel members up. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd just like to thank all four speakers for sticking exactly to time. So we have a full 20, nearly 25 minutes now for uh, panel discussion. Um, we've got the roving mics. Uh, sorry, Marion, could you just pass me my phone? My phone. My phone. My phone. Yeah. So we've got a couple of questions which have come up online, first of all. So I'm just going to start by reading out a couple of those. Uh, I'll put those to the panel uh, of experts. But remember, we've got lots of people in the room who are also experts in CFTR uh, gene editing. So again, if there's questions which uh, the panel are addressing or comments which are raised, I'd also like to invite those people to offer uh, some suggestions and advice as well. Um, just one question for Matt to start with. If lung gene therapy works, could sinus therapy be the next step? Which I think was... Um, something you were looking at, specifically for the panel, how do we approach uh, treating multi-organ CF disease? Uh, and is this feasible given the likely cost for each treatment? I, I think it was nicely described yesterday in the plenary session of um, CF has been a great example, and in, in my field actually the treatment of pediatric ALL, is um, the iterative advances that one makes. And so we've certainly and I hopefully uh, convinced a few of you taking the strategy, you start with the sinus and you move to the lung, and I think the question's right. Then you start thinking about, well, what, what other target tissues um, uh, then would be next amenable? Um, so I, I just hope we don't, we, and again, it was said at the uh, session yesterday, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good enough. Um, so nonetheless, of course, we need to be thinking about you know, the pancreas and, and the gut and other tissues, and that's why these nanoparticles are kind of, kind of cool, because they may go there, but of course, the tropism for a nanoparticle that, as you, as you highlighted, that goes to the lung or a specific cell in the lung may not be the same nanoparticle that goes to the right cell in the pancreas or the gut or the testes or some of the other tissues. So I just say we, we keep an eye on that, but I don't think we uh, stop doing things because we don't have everything all figured out in 2022. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, another just two or three questions on the, the app and then I'll open it up to the floor. This question is for Stephanie. Um, from your library screening studies, have you identified certain polymer types that cluster? Uh, for example, modifications that are preferred by certain cell types. Uh, and the, the question is wondering about the cell type specificity and if rational design pattern uh, can be employed to make improvements. Yeah. Um. Uh, so in general, we do have certain uh, polymers that we, polymers and certain polymer structures or, or um, chemical trends that we, that are true across many different cell types. Um, so we have some of our kind of favorites that we always start with when, we, when we're screening because they generally work pretty well. Um, there are some, you know, we have some early studies. I, uh, most of the, our work in the past has been on, on cancer. So for example, we found some that uh, polymers that tend to work really well on cancer cells and not on non-cancer cells or, or vice versa. Um, in terms of what are the me molecular mechanisms of that, that's a great question um, that everybody asks and I wish I knew the answer to it. Um, we, uh, uh, what we're starting to do is to take all of the um, screening data we have from over the years and try to build a computational model that will eventually become more predictive so that we can have a little bit more rational design. So we have some ideas. We know hydrophobicity um, tends to trend with 
both efficacy and toxicity um, to some degree. We know that uh, the charge or the, uh, the PKA of um, these materials are, are very important. Um, so we have certain patterns that we, uh, that we know about, and in terms of being able to predict, um, that's something that we're hoping to um, drive toward as we move toward a, a little bit more of a computational side as well. Can I follow up on, on the PBAs? Um, they're, they're super exciting. I'm wondering, though, you know, one of the issues that's plagued now the AAV field and lipid nanoparticle field is something that works in cells in a culture, doesn't work in an animal, something that works in a mouse, doesn't work in a non-human primate. Humans, things that work in a non-human primate don't work in the humans. Do these particles suffer under that problem, or is that going to be an issue you will have to deal with as well? I suppose that that probably will be an issue to some extent. I uh, we haven't really moved out of rodents, so you know, so we know that we have particles that work in vitro that then work in vivo in mice, and then they work in vivo in rats. Um, do they work? Uh, we have some that work in mini pigs as well in, in um, certain situations. We haven't gone into the non-primate situation, uh, non-human primate situation. Um, I. Don't, I don't think there's any reason they would be exempt from those kinds of concerns. Um, but kind of, kind of as you said, you know, we are where we are. We got to, and, and hopefully yep. as we move forward, um, we'll find that um, we can at least use the smaller animal models or the in vitro models to narrow down the possibilities and, and get a little bit closer to something that hopefully will work. Yeah. Since we are on the topic, can I add one more question? What about the toxicity? Did you do an analysis on that? Uh, so in the particular ones that I showed here, uh, no, but in, let's see, last Saturday, we just finished collecting a whole bunch of organs that we're sending off to a pathologist. So um, we're starting to do those in-depth analyses. So far, what we've done is we've looked at liver enzymes um, in, the, in the serum. We've looked at um, inflammatory cytokines in the serum. So from very easy um, methods like that or looking at the change in, in body weight, we don't see any problems. But um, hopefully in, in a few weeks before the end of the year, we're hoping to get um, a, a report from a pathologist uh, confirming or, 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 or telling us otherwise. Okay, we've got a couple more questions online, but I'm in, I'd be keen to see questions from the floor. So does anybody have a question? We'll use the mic. There's one at the front here. Hi, Tom. I'm from New York City, Iowa. Um, this question also, Dr. Chen. Um, uh, with the PD, PDA, is, you have an advantage of being able to like, modulate the properties of these things. And with cystic fibrosis, there's the, the, the disease itself can, can be a barrier to delivery of the therapy. Etc. Have you thought about like in vitro assays where you might be able to uh, figure out these nanoparticles that actually, uh, the properties of these nanoparticles that actually can be through uh, CF, ASL, etc.? Uh, so I, I guess, sorry, thanks. <laughs> uh, in, in vitro, uh, I, I think there is a big enough leap between the in vitro and in vivo. Um, trends that we see, you know, we do have certain polymers that we narrow down from the in vitro studies, um, but in vivo, they tend to be a little bit different. So uh, what I would be interested in is, like, that's one of the reasons that I, I would like to start working with um, a, a CF animal model um, to see if there are differences there. You know, uh, just going from our in vitro to sort of healthy uh, wild type animal models, we see already differences in how they act. So. Um, you know, while there are there are probably assays that we could try to do in vitro to figure that out, I, I think it would be more um, effective to do that in the in vivo model. So hopefully we'll we'll get to see that soon. Okay, any other questions from the floor? Yep, yeah, sure at the back. This isn't a roving mic; it's a running mic. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, yes, I'm interested from a kind of longer term therapeutic. So, you know, from Clinda or right, right strategy perspective, uh, for, you know, genomic correction of specific CFTR mutations, is it thought that, you know, each guy RNA would need to be approved as an individual drug? Um, yeah. How does that? Uh, I'll deal with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So currently, yes. Uh, currently, the FDA treats every guide RNA as a different drug. Um, that being said, um, the, the field and the FDA recognize that that is not a sustainable way of developing truly personalized uh, medicines. Um, and so I think that it is up to all of us 
to help the FDA and the other regulatory authorities become comfortable with the concept that not every guide RNA has to be treated as a different drug and go through the wholly independent process. But I think it's on us and them to partner on how you get there. And again, it's not going to happen in 2022, but if we show, you know, and we need, you know, hopefully we can show our sickle cell program is safe and that gives some comfort level that then we could do that. So it's going to be a process. It's almost essential for a base editing, prime editing process, right? Because that's designed to be patient specific mutations. So, yeah. Sorry, kind of a follow up to that comment. Um, so, would the thought process be something like, you know, it's going to be a big lift on the first approval, but then there'd be some sort of biosimilar or and a type strategy that you go after for the additional ones? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone knows exactly how this would work, but I think something like that. And, you know, I don't think, of course, you would ever want to take a, a new guide and just say, well, I made it, I made it, uh, it's going to work. I think what we're talking about is really, can you simplify and streamline the preclinical testing, um, you know, and, uh, so that it doesn't have to go through that full heavy lift the first time, maybe slightly left the second time. Can you de develop... Um, assays that are predictive of what's going to happen in vivo, so then the regulators can be comfortable that that preclinical analytic is comfortable to predict what will happen, um, you know, in, in, a, in a patient. Of course, you know, this is an amazing field because CF and Vertex and others have pioneered that approach, yeah. uh, which is really <coughs> remarkable, and we should we should build on that. Yeah. Can I just build on that question and maybe ask Marion in the context of prime editing? Um, you, you've got some really impressive values there for, for prime editing, for one of the mutations in particular. But kind of two questions. Do all, edit, do all regions of the CFTR gene edit with equal efficiency? And then what's the distance that you can edit with prime editing? Because if you are, one guide could do 40 or 50 or 50 base pairs. That's half an exon in many cases. Yeah, no, true. Um, so at this moment, we've only really investigated a few mutations. Um, and indeed, there are differences in editing efficiency, and there are actually also quite some differences between what we see in hex cells and what we see in organoid models. Oh, sorry, yeah. this is not clear enough. So yeah, in general, um, there are differences in editing efficiencies, and in particular in the organoid model. I haven't shared the, the most recent data we have on, on the S1303K. But there, there are quite some differences. I think what is an important um, determinant of prime editing outcomes in primary cells is really this mismatch repair, um, which you can modulate. And so this has been described in the most recent work from David Leo. And so we're seeing that this is an important element that you can uh, see to modulate for, by MLH1 overexpression, or you even try to avoid by designing your guides in a different way. And because you have the flexibility, this is possible. Now, regarding the distance, we've only really looked at the, the biggest difference between the Nikan and the editing side of about 30 uh, nucleotides, but, um, well, even twin PE systems have been described that can really write huge sequences to Tobachi Tsada. So I think you can really, with prime editing, cover a big range. Yeah. Uh, and a quick question for Matt. So does your HDR strategy for 508 work for I-507? Yeah. 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 Sorry, say that again. Do, does your editing strategy for F508 also work for I507? Oh, we haven't looked. We should. Right. Yeah, it should. Yeah. Um, the guide RNA is close enough to donor template. Yeah. It, yeah. it should. Yeah. Um, I'll just go back to a couple of quick questions uh, online and then more to the floor. Um, there's one that says, why do you think the IN admin was so bad at lung epithelial cells? Uh, I think... Um, so... I, I guess some of the data that I didn't show, um, uh, again, the, this technology was in initially developed from, for some other applications. We work a lot in the immunoengineering field, um, and we know that these uh, particles will tend to be very good at transfecting macrophages. Um, so it, it may just be that they got gobbled up real quick as soon as they got to the lungs. Um, we also know that there are difficulties um, in getting across the mucus, uh, mucus layers. Um, so uh, that's something that um, cert some nanoparticle groups uh, spend a lot of time trying to optimize, and especially having these positively charged uh, polymers. Um, you know, positively charged polymers will have tropism toward the lungs after systemic administration, but they sometimes will get caught in, um, in the mucus. So it, it could just be that they were unable to um, get efficiently to the cells of interest, and then also just got eaten up by the, uh, um, an unintended cell type on the way there. I, th I think that's probably what happened. Yeah, thank you. Um, Margarita? Uh, question for Matthew. Um, coming back to the regulator's approval of um, you know, uh, 
reanimating reagents. Um, I don't know, but what's exactly the experience from the COVID vaccine's um, approval? Because probably each time it's new genetic material, you know, this can have different off-target effects and playing devil's advocate, you can think that one guide RNA could not target anything, but another one can target open genes, for instance. Yeah. Um... Agreed. And so it's not that, as I said, you can just say, um, well, here's my new guide RNA, you have to approve it. It's just, are, you, are they going to ask for a million dollar animal tox study if, say, the bioinformatics and the in vitro specificity assays um, show equivalency, not identity, because of course they're going to target different sites, but are they functionally equivalent in terms of genotox, then do you have to go then do a big animal tox study uh, to get that second guide RNA approved. So that's what I'm talking about is a stream, potentially, and I'm way out over my skis here, um, potentially uh, is there sort of a, a can, can we reach an agreed upon set of uh, in vitro assays that would allow the FDA to get comfortable for a early phase trial in humans for a, a unique molecule or a unique guide? And but following up on that, yeah. maybe, you know, the approach of the super exome that um, yeah. Patrick usually talks about yeah. might be, you know, one drug which yeah. actually serves multiple mutations. Well, that's clearly our idea, right? That's I don't we don't call our cDNA insertion a super exon, but that's what it it's a super, it's the full super exon. So yes, that that was why we went that way because we just weren't comfortable thinking that we were going to be able to one by one knock off the two thousand different variants that cause this disease. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just a, a question for the panel on editing. Um, I think, Anna, you mentioned briefly in one of your slides about the use of the um, transposases. Um, we've also not heard a huge amount about zinc fingers and tailings. Do you think there's something new coming down the tracks? Do you think there's other old stuff that we should go back and have a look at? As I mentioned, there are um, um, problems related to delivery, to efficiency, so the, the field is moving very quickly uh, forward and beyond the CRISPR fields, so there are a lot of recombinases, uh, transposases, retrotransposases that are emerging. There is a large investment in finding new technology. Uh, so uh, I guess that uh, CRISPR is already becoming old. It's uh, it's impressive, and uh, so there are definitely new technology uh, that are emerging uh, in the field, and uh, so. Can you uh, yeah. ask a question related to this? Stephanie, you mentioned that uh, one problem related to the viral vector is the cargo size. So what about the, the particles? Do, 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 uh, is there, are they totally independent for the size? Or? Uh, we haven't found a size limit. We had an early, uh, very early on, we had a, a paper. Um, this was um, looking at IPSC re reprogramming. And we were de uh, delivering a plasmid that was about 40,000 uh, base pairs. So um, that's, that's pretty big, you know, and most of the types of genes that we would want to deliver would, would fit into that size. So there might be a, a size limit, but probably not one that's kind of relevant to anything we want to deliver. So my, my, my thought on that, Patrick, is, is that, um, and we haven't talked at all about in, in, in vivo immunogenicity to these various genome editing platforms. One of the theoretic advantages of zinc finger nucleases is the DNA binding platform is based on a domain, you know, the zinc finger domain, so it's likely to be less immunogenic. The FOC1 nuclease is quite short, so it's likely to be less immunogenic than the very large nuclease Cas9s, and then the prime editors and base editors are even worse in terms yeah. of the number of foreign components. So it's possible that a look backwards might work if, if, if you really needed to show redosing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we've also heard about the base editors which have been developed recently fused to tile effectors or zinc fingers if you want to get into yeah. the mitochondrial genome. Not directly relevant, but there may be some applications there to, to come back to. Um, just one question from the, from the app. Uh, it says, if the gene size is not a constraint for nanoparticles, can you deliver CFTR with some uh, drug-inducible constructs which enhance uh, cell proliferation? 
Uh, that's not something we've looked into. I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't uh, deliver it. I guess with the methods that we're using, so for when we're delivering mRNA, um, usually we see peak expression within, I mean, 12 hours is the peak expression time point. Uh, within about four days, we don't really see expression anymore. So I think directly delivering um, the, the protein itself is probably not the most sustainable uh, a treatment. But, um, but, you know, if we can deliver something that will then lead to a more sustained effect, um, some sort of editing, I, I think that would be the... Um, yeah, I think that that's probably the better approach. Yeah, uh, to say in vitro, NHEJ editing, when you deliver a protein, is done by 12 to 16 hours. So you do not need sustained expression to create indels. Yeah, yeah. Um, one last question from the app. Um, it's one for you, Matt. How is the mouse sinus uh, region defined? The mouse maxillary sinus is mostly closed off, but Lucifrase delivered to the nasal instal Nasal installation slow, show lots of general nasal conducting airway transduction there as well normally. Uh, so the question then I suppose is, are you using general mouse nasal, nasal airway epithelial tissue as a surrogate for sinus tissue? Okay, so um, for the uh, mouse and mouse experiments, I, I'm going to have to defer what cell type we used in that because I, I don't remember. But in the human and mouse, they were it was human sinus tissues being embedded in fibrinogen or matrigel um, and then just squirted as a cellular gel complex into a sinus that had either been uh, debrided through mechanical methods, which for the mouse experiments we gave, uh, Don gave up on because it was inconsistent and you can imagine sticking a brush into a mouse sinus isn't that reproducible and friendly. Uh, she used gas um, to debride. Uh, which worked, but we all decided sulfur dioxide was not the way. And so she, she ended up with those experiments using a, a detergent way of debriding the sinus. But there are sinus cells going into the sinus. Yeah, thank you. Um, just on the panel, are there any questions or topics that think you think we have we've a question not there. covered? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Hey, John. Well, you know, you saw a, a, an example um, by immunofluorescence um, staining the different subtypes. And as I said, we're not getting, you know, billions of cells engrafted. So, uh, you know, the probability we'd find an ionocyte is, you know, zero for a technical reason. But we're seeing all the major sub, uh, cell types derive from the basal cells um, by immunofluorescence. The architecture looks generally normal. So um, obviously we can do more. But yeah, I think at a first, first reasonable path, it, l it looks pretty reasonable. Anybody else in the room? Uh, yeah? Uh, kind of a general <clears throat> GA question. So it makes total sense to use the bioinformatics approaches to, to identify the places that might produce an off-target effect. What about looking everywhere else? And the genome's kind of a big place, and I'm, I'm worried about surprises, or wondering about surprises. So does it make sense to pick all the ones that have some, where there is some complementarity to the guide, but also some subset of the rest to see if things happen that wouldn't be easily predicted? Prediction is just the first step. Of course, the best is uh, to experimentally test uh, uh, the off-targets, and that's why uh, genome-wide uh, techniques are uh, in place. We use the GuideSeq, but there are a number of uh, ways to test uh, off-target activity uh, by using a nuclease approach. It's more difficult to uh, first predict, but experimentally test uh, base editing or uh, uh, prime editors. Because those, of course, they may, I mean, the deamination may occur beyond the guide uh, RNA targeted, but also the enzyme moving around the nuclei. So those will require a more uh, uh, a monitor of the situation in long term. I mean, experimental tests are already ongoing. So uh, soon we will uh, start to see the first results in sickle cell anemia or uh, thalassemia. So those will tell us 
if off target are really a big issue. No? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. just be a bit snarky here. Uh, I bet pollution generates oh, okay. more mutations okay. in our lung than anything we're going to possibly do. Um, I think environmental exposures and the mutagenic burden being created by uh, the air we breathe, it, the cigarettes people smoke, hopefully, I mean, I know CF patients shouldn't smoke, but uh, the point being is, is let's put this all in context too, yeah. you know, and risk benefit, what's the background uh, frequency. I was talking to uh, uh, somebody last, earlier this week about their editing in the liver, and they've looked at liver cells, and those cells are wildly abnormal because of the, what they have to deal with coming through the gut. Um, and yet, liver cancer is a pretty rare thing. Not, un not, not, not zero, but it's pretty darn rare. I think that, for example, gene therapy um, had a big lecture from the application of retroviral vectors yeah. and lentiviral vectors. I mean, the integration was a big issue. Um, nevertheless, uh, the uh, therapeutic outcome uh, for um, severe uh, immunodeficiency are impressive. You know? So I think we can, of course, as Matt was saying, uh, uh, evaluate the balance of uh, uh, side effects with the, the therapeutic outcome. But of course, everything should be monitored. Yeah. So. Okay, I think that's where we have to leave it today. Um, I'd just like to thank the Foundation for allowing us to uh, host this symposium today. I'd like to thank my co-chair, Anna, and all four panel members for a great uh, set of uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you.